Welcome everybody. Let's start our session of today, which is called, get it, <laughs> at your service. We're going to talk about enablers. Oh, okay. is it working? Yeah. yeah. At your service, how, how Western enablers facilitate global corruption and how to stop it. There is a great summary one could do about this topic, which is we could also say when it comes to anti-corruption, we better think things through. Because when we see very narrowly at solutions, at issues that we could work on and leave loopholes behind, what we're causing is just a displacement of activity. And this is exactly what is happening with the enablers at the moment. The topic of the enablers is very interesting because also we don't see them. We don't really see them. I'll go back to that one later. We don't really see them. Let's look at the next one. Next. Next. Yeah. You know when there's a situation of corruption, there's a lot of people that actually have an effect on it. Some are directly perpetrators, are directly involved in it. A few small percentage of it could be enablers or gatekeepers. They have the choice to be either or. There's also a small percentage of people who may be bystanders and are knowingly watching what's happening. And the great majority of the rest are the victims because the victims are always collective. This shows us how important the enablers are and how important that decision to make it or not can break it. And this is a topic that um, brings us here today. We will talk basically about three questions. Who are these enablers and what, what is their impact? What are the perspectives from the private sector on these enablers or gatekeepers? And what are the policy options at hand that we could possibly implement or that we could implement better that are already in place? This is an interesting topic also because it connects with some of the sessions that started today and connect with some of the discussions that will continue tomorrow. So this is a really growing conversation that we hope to carry on from one place to the other. There's an amazing panel uh, here today. It's really a privilege to have so many different strong experts and activists on this issue. Uh, that will offer very different perspectives on the subject, including all of you, because we hope that all of you as audience will also join. There's three channels to join, by the way. One, I will be calling on you, and there's one mic I see here, maybe there's another one being installed in the back. Oh yeah, thanks. Great, there's one moving mic and there's one fixed mic here, so when, whenever there's you know, a call to you as audience, we're sure there's a lot of things you, can, you will be able to contribute uh, to that you will use it. But we also have a mentee. I don't know if you're familiar with a mentee, but this is a very fun and interactive way to do a little survey and to en encourage all of you to contribute with your opinions. So. Um, all you need to go to do is to the menti.com website or scan that uh, QR code and type in that number and you will get the questions uh, that are there for you where you will be also able to contribute with what you know on this topic. Uh, we will be repeating it again and again so you can, if you're not doing it now, you can do it again later as you go. Rachel will be monitoring the answers that are going to be flowing in. So let's start um, here to my left. I have um, Florindo Chibukute, who is the founder of Friends of Angola, as an activist and a blogger, and has come all the way uh, to talk to us a little bit about the impact of enablers uh, in Angola. You know, there's this famous 
um, case um, where Isabel dos Santos was involved together with advisors and generals to Angola, by which a very complicated corruption web enabled them to um, enrich themselves and also enrich Western um, consulting companies through a series, a complicated series of structured shell companies. Florindo, welcome. We would like to know from you a little bit about what were those enablers? Um, what, what were those enablers in that case or in Angola and what was the impact that you think that caused? Well, th thank you very much, Ronita, um, um, in, in for, in, for Transparency International to invite me in this panel. I think it's a very important and pressing issue, in particular right now, uh, as we see the, um, how corruption is deteriorating uh, democracy. Uh, so to answer your question, um, I mean, I, I used to live in the U.S. and, and in a couple, um, two years ago, I decided to go back to Angola, and I've, I was there for almost two years, and, and I wasn't just reading articles from my office in D.C. I was I actually went there and see on on the ground the impact that corruption um, has done on Angolans. Um, it, it's it's it it. it it has a tremendous uh, impact in terms of um, uh, really uh, degrading ways of living, uh, lack of access of basic needs, uh, such as water, access to uh, electricity, uh, in employment is extremely high, in particular among the youth. Um, it, 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 I mean, it, it's, it's almost humane the ways in which people in Angola in, in different places, different provinces are living. Um, and, and I mean, you, can, you cannot just uh, take $2 billion in your, in your briefcase and, and travel all the way to Portugal or Dubai. I mean, you need intelligent people, uh, consulting firms to help you laundry the money. And, and so the, that's where the enablers did. They facilitate the the, um, the the uh, the robbery uh, of uh, Angolans, the public funds that was supposed to help improve lives of millions of Angolans, uh, uh, by uh, using private banks uh, in Angola and Portugal and places like uh, U.S. Uh, Delaware, uh, open offshore account. Um, and laundry billions and billions of dollars. There's an estimate that probably more than $400 billion left in Angola. Um, and the results that we, today in Angola is that we have more than 4,000 uh, children access to school, outside school system. We have hundreds of kids studying under the tree because there is no, there is no classrooms. So the result of, of the, 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 this robbery uh, is that we have extremely uh, high unemployment in Angola um, that is uh, leaving uh, uh, families without uh, food on the table. Uh, so the, 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 the consequences are visible because I was there, I was able to uh, meet some of those folks. You don't have to go too far from the capital. In fact, in Wintin Luanda, you will see people uh, fighting for uh, uh, trash uh, uh, to 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 get food so they can and and those no are those those, those are young folks uh, uh, who have been robbed they 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 past they they present their future um, and 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 so why why should you care well I mean because it's not just about degrading the the lives condition of Angolans but it's so degrading the the the, the democratic system which is the same that happened throughout the world, how money uh, that have been sacked from public funds has been used uh, not just to preempt uh, uh, folks on the ground communities to have a better life, but also to empower kleptocrats around the world. You should care because kleptocracy, they are very united and they are, um, in, in, in almost everywhere, using the money to launder the image, places like the U.S. 
Uh, the, the war in Ukraine has been, that's cost money, and that's where that money come from. Not just from Russia, but from different places, probably including Angola, where the Russians have the mining companies. So PwC, Boston Corp Consulting, um, uh, uh, KPMG, according to ICIJ, you probably have uh, read Luanda Leake's article, that's well known as Isabel dos Santos, but they're still there in Angola. They're still helping uh, facilitating the corruption. They were, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable the amount of money they helped to, to steal uh, from Angola, but they're still there. Um, so what can we do in order to preempt dictators, kleptocrats, stealing the money for, they, uh, for, for use for their own purpose and empower kleptocrats around the world? So that they, they can, they, so they don't erode not just the conditions, the life conditions of uh, locals, but also our democratic system. Thanks, Florindo. Thanks, Florindo. One, one follow up question there, quickly, perhaps. Generally, what, what would be the types of enablers that you find, for example, in that case, in the, in the Dos Santos case, uh, including? the national enablers and the international enablers and the and sort of what types of, what categories? Um. Uh, thank you, Jenny. that's a good question. So we had, so uh, as I said in the beginning, you don't steal $2 billion you put in the pocket, you travel to UDC, you, you cannot do that, right? It's just a lot of money. So, uh, so first, the political system, high ranking officials, they do help facilitate the Angolan banks to make sure that the money was able to get out from the, the Angola. So now, that includes local banks in Angola. Some of them, they have also branches in Portugal, Cabo Verde, and elsewhere. Uh, so through the Angolan banks, they were able to, 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 to launder the money. And once it was in Europe, the money was clean, then they could buy property, uh, whether it's in Portugal, whether in UK or in Angola. So, so there was a combination, Juanita. There was a combination between individuals, domestic uh, politicians with power, whether it's in the bank sector or in the army. Uh, so they, they, they facilitated. Then outside, so you have uh, corporations like PwC, Boston Consulting, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth, who understand, understand the, 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 the laws, the loopholes within those countries, whether it's in the US or in Europe, so they could, they could help launder this money. Um, and, 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 and as a result, the Biden administration um, uh, issued a sanctions for the first time in Angola history, December of last year, against two generals, General Kupelipa, General Dino, uh, as well as the former, um, uh, the former president's daughter, uh, Mrs. Isabel dos Santos. Uh, but this is only the beginning. I mean, it, uh, we, we, we still have a long way to go, but to answer your question, that's, uh, it's a combination of individuals within Angola, high-ranking officials, uh, bank, bankers, as in outside, you have those uh, corporations that they help, whether it's in the US or in Europe, to make sure that they could use the money to buy property uh, uh, anywhere, including New York, uh, so they could they could clean the money. Thanks, Florindo. Indeed, the, the the Dos Santos shell companies range from Delaware to Dubai and the offshore that's companies. So that's that's the extent of the help you need. And, and it's interesting to also continue managing this duality of of gate, gatekeepers and enablers because imagine if. Imagine if one of those companies, imagine if McKinsey, instead of accepting to help reform uh, Son and Gold for millions of dollars and cash it from the accounts in Dubai, instead said, no, and I denounce this. I don't like this. You laugh. Why do you laugh? <laughs> because we don't expect that, but we should. That's one, one of the things that, that should start changing. And it shows also the difference. And look at the, uh, the role of the gatekeepers. This case was known because of the role of the International Consortium on Investigative Journalism. 
if they had not investigated the case, well, the DOJ in the U.S. also did. So th there was a dual, a dual role there. So there you see the relevance of these actors. Um, we also have here Tutu Alicante, who is executive director of uh, EG Justice, an organization that works for the promotion of human rights and the promotion of democracy in Equatorial Guinea. For full disclosure, I'm also a member of the board, a very proud member of the board of EG Justice. Um, Tutu, in, in, in the case, we also have the case of Teori Nobiang, who has been, he's, uh, he and his family, including his son, have been prosecuted in the US, in France, in Spain, well, in, in Spain and the Netherlands and Switzerland, has, assets have been seized and confiscated as well uh, on cases of embezzlement. What's the impact of that, in, of, of, of the corruption or the embezzlement in Equatorial Guinea? And what's the role of enablers? Are, are we talking about similar enablers? And in the case of Angola, are there different ones? Thank you, Juanita. And uh, first of all, it's great to be in this uh, room with these uh, wonderful, you know, smart people. They know more about I, more than I do about enablers. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion afterward. What's been an impact? Uh, so one thing that many people don't know about Equatorial Guinea, you know, is that this is a country with, for many many years, the highest GDP per capita on the African continent, right? This is a country with the highest income per capita on the African continent only recently surpassed by Seychelles. Yet, this is the country with some of the lowest human development index, right? So in Equatorial Guinea, in fact, you have the widest gap between that income per capita and the human development index, right? What that really means is that in a country with vast amounts of money, my nieces and nephew do not have running water, do not have a school to go to, what that really means is that my sister Chiquitina, when she was 19 years old and she was pregnant, died at the hospital without electricity because there was no electricity, there was no doctor, and she passed with something that you know, in any other country, with that type of resources, uh, she would have been saved. And I'm telling you a story that is very dear to, my, to me, and every single Equator Guinean you meet have a similar story. So that's what it means. Enablers. Uh, uh, in 2010, I was here in Washington, D.C., and it was my first time in Congress. And I was in the room when two lawyers and two real estate agents were supposed to testify about their role in helping Theodore Ring bring over $300 million into the U.S. And these four individuals plead the fifth. That's uh, basically saying I'm not going to declare against my, uh, myself and walk out of the room. And that was just me. But imagine we have 1.2 million people in Equatorial Guinea being in that room and seeing that the people that have basically driven the getaway car with uh, Theodorine and millions and millions of dollars are walking out of the room and there is nothing you can do about it. That is very, very disempowering. Are we talking about the same, the same enablers? Mostly yes, right? First of all, I should say, how many, how, many, uh, how many people does that picture resonate with? How many people know when I'm talking about the usual suspects? Anyone knows what I'm talking about? Otherwise, I'm not going to make any jokes about the usual suspects. <laughs> One of the famous lines in that movie, if you've seen it, you know, is that the, 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 the most compelling trick the devil ever pulled is convincing everyone that he doesn't exist. When I look at kleptocrats, the most convincing thing that kleptocrats have done and continue to do is convincing people they are incredibly smarter than they are to do their bad deeds. And that's happening with lawyers. Who t any single lawyer in the, I'm, actually I'm here with a lot of lawyers, so I'm not gonna say many bad things about lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> but most lawyers that I know are smarter than Theodorine. Most bankers that I know are smarter than Theodorine and these kleptocrats in Angola and those countries, right? but they get away with it. How they get away with it by using these people. In the case of Theodorine, we're talking about lawyers that created multiple shell companies to bring into the US hundreds of millions of dollars. We're talking about bankers, Simon Correri, who was working at the, at the uh, Riggs Bank, who helped Theodorine and his father buy mansions here in Potomac, Maryland, which is about 
15, 20 minutes from where we are right now. There's still two mansions out there that belong to the president of my country and the $30 million state in Malibu. We are talking about re, uh, real estate agents and art dealers. That's, a, that's an important one, the art dealer space. Many people would not know that in my country, Equatorial Guinea, you have the largest collection of Michael Jackson memorabilia. I don't know if any of you guys remember who Michael Jackson was. <laughs> the glove, the jackets, the shoes, all these things are in Equatorial Guinea. And that happens not because Theodorini is super smart, but because there's someone willing to help him buy that. In France, in the Bia Malaki case, Theodorini spent $15 million in art pieces, right? And if you're following what's happening right now with oligarchs from Russia, you know that art is one of the key places where many of these oligarchs and kleptocrats are hiding their money, right? Um, I'm gonna be short, but what, what, for me, one of the important things over here is when we talk about uh, enablers is to think, okay, who are enablers, right? And you guys should forgive me because uh, as Celia Cruz says, you know, my English is not very good looking. <laughs> but when I think about who enablers are, I'm thinking about both people that facilitate, you know who Celia Cruz is, right? Yes. That joke, all right. <laughs> She's the one that says my English is not very good looking. But I'm thinking about both people that facilitate this corruption, and actually corruption is not, this transnational kleptocracy, I think is a better way of capturing it, right? As well as people who excuse it, people who cover it up, people who whitewash it, right? And that's where beyond the lawyers, accountants, bankers, and those guys, we have to think about what are the PR firms, what are the marketing firms, doing to whitewash the image of these guys. With Russia, Ukraine, we've been talking a lot about disinformation, misinformation. PR firms are a key link when it comes to misinformation about what's happening. The, the only reason the government of, uh, President of Equatorial Guinea is able to donate $3 million to UNESCO, the only reason he is able to come to the White House and be received as the best friend of the United States is because you have PR firms who at one point in Washington DC, Equatorial Guinea was the second largest spender on PR firms on K Street per capita wise. Second largest only to Saudi Arabia. Again, this is a very small country of 1.2 million people, right? Spending that kind of money on PR firms and that buys them access, right? And we're also talking about IFIs. The IMF has an incredible role in legitimizing governments. When the IMF comes to your country and issues an Article 4 report or even a press, con a press statement saying that this country has enacted these laws on anti-corruption, this country uh, has done this and this and these different things, and the IMF loans, in the case of Equatorial Guinea, $300 million to that country, it tells many other investors that, okay, this is a legitimate government. And we're talking about a government that just last week won elections again with 95% of the vote, right? This is a government that's been in power since 1979, longer than many of you uh, have lived on this earth, right? Since, imagine, since President Carter was president in this country, all right? The last one I'm gonna talk about, and I hope this is not super controversial, is governments, right? Governments in rule of law nations, governments like the government of the United States, right? Next week, there is uh, the US Africa uh, Leaders Summit here in Washington, DC. The Biden administration, which came out of the gate talking about anti-corruption, democracy, human rights being three pillars of this, this administration, is inviting 52, member, 52 presidents of, of Africa to Washington DC next week, including the president of Equatorial Guinea, right? Who would be delivering an address on environmental protection. What is the message they're having of Biang in Washington DC right next to Biden sends to the rest of Central African kleptocrats? This is a good guy. If he's body body with, if he's rubbing elbows with Biden, he must be okay. That, to me, is enabling the type of transnational cryptocurrency that we're here to discuss today. Thank you. Thank you, Toto.
You, you say it. Um, I think it's a, it's a crucial point also to realize that enablers, when we think of enablers, it's not just those who get involved with criminal intent to help canvas the deals, or those who just profit because it's nice money, uh, but also those of us who, with our reactions, are not clear enough and don't set a clear message, or because we gamble with ideas of diplomacy and uh, policy that, 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 that actually cause harm. That's why we, we need to think through things. Um, because this balance of things is, is not always, is not always um, positive. There's also a big problem with this issue of, of enablers because as we see, it's, 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 it's shades of, it wouldn't be gray, what color would that be? Pink. Um, is, 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 is different roles of involvement, and I guess you'll talk about this, Rachel, later, but um, it's also, these neighbors, most of them are actually licit, legal professions, legal companies, PR, international financial institutions, <laughs> uh, 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 banks, lawyers, accountants, legal professions, legal people that exercise a normal legal profession that one way or another end up uh, doing this service. What do private sectors think about this? What do colleagues think about it? I w we wonder if there's anybody here from the private sector in the room who would, I know it's a bit shy to cold call somebody and I could understand if you're thinking about raising your hand, but if there was somebody who could, who could share your views about how does it feel from that end? We tried. <laughs> we tried with lots of effort to bring people from the private sector. Uh, many of them were interested. They really couldn't come to their credit. But it's also something that is difficult to talk about. So let's acknowledge both things. We were hoping here there would be somebody, while there is, <laughs> while there is, um, I wonder, Rachel, if you could share a word about how you see, how have you seen the, the, the perspective from the private sector from the UK experience, if you... I can share a quick case study, if, yeah. that's, if that's helpful. Yeah. Um, so, about four years ago, I, I don't know, time since COVID, like, kind of blurs for me, but I think it was about four years ago, um, the National Crime Agency, which is UK uh, kind of law enforcement body that investigate kleptocracy, they announced that they had uh, arrested two individuals, uh, both foreign nationals, one of them was um, a PEP, a politically exposed person who had previously been in the government um, in his country. I'm not going to name them because they're especially litigious and being British, I'm really worried about libel, obviously, with our libel laws. Um, but he had been a politically exposed person and um, five years previously, I mean, splashed all over the internet if you Google him, he had been accused, I think even convicted of embezzling millions and millions of dollars. This was, this was well known. Um, but they had arrested him and his wife um, for money laundering into the UK. And there wasn't a lot of information out there, but at TIUK we did a little bit of Googling, um, checked out our, our UK beneficial ownership register, and within an hour we'd, we'd found quite a lot of information on this guy. And we realized that within the five years since he had been very publicly, I think, accused and even convicted of embezzlement and, and corruption, he had uh, bought three UK properties. He had opened several UK bank accounts. He had also hired uh, a company formation agent um, to open several UK companies in his name. Now, in the UK, um, estate agents, company formation agents, uh, bankers, lawyers are all required to do due diligence on their clients. And they are required um, not, not to launder money. Um, so this, this was a compliance failure, right? Because if we could just, with a bit of Googling and looking at open source information, realize um, there were all these accusations and convictions, um, something had gone wrong because all of those people involved, the, the lawyers, the estate agents, um, the bankers, the, the company formation agent, would have had to have done due diligence on this guy. But for some reason, uh, they still uh, progressed uh, setting up those companies, buying that property, setting up those bank accounts. So probably one of two things happened, I think, in this, this instance. Either they didn't even bother doing even the most basic due diligence, or uh, they did. Uh, they, they found 
yeah, this evidence of wrongdoing and either did nothing about it or just sent a quick message off to the National Crime Agency, we call it a kind of suspicious activity report, said, right, yeah, done, I've done my, done my duty and then continued anyway, which I think points probably to wider problems with the UK system, which I can talk about later. Thank you. I wonder if there's someone who could share their views from the audience. Are you already warming up? Yeah, there's a hand raised. Please take the mic. Yeah, I am Ana, Ana Gomez from uh, uh, Transparency International Portugal. And uh, I, I just would like to highlight that indeed, uh, as uh, uh, Florindo and, uh, and uh, um, Tutu have pointed out, the level of complicity of these enablers goes to the top. That's the only thing that explains that, for instance, people like Isabel dos Santos, a very obvious pep, politically exposed person, she was the daughter of the president of Angola, could own banks in a European country, my country, Portugal, because she owned banks. And she actually, uh, she, 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 she was shareholder of, uh, major shareholder of some banks and became the main holder of a bank that she bought from the state, the Portuguese state during the crisis, the, 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 the Troika years, the following up the subprime crisis and so on. This could not have been achieved without full complicity of, of the, the central authorities, the central bank authorities, the, the government authorities, at the national level, but also at the European level. And when pressed by activists like myself, they started acting, the resistance was also met at the highest political level. There's a big debate in my country now whether the prime minister, the current prime minister, and the then governor of the, the central bank, uh, they talked about the governor trying to uh, to uh, lift the fit and proper classification so that she could be a uh, owner of the bank. And the prime minister thinking this was not opportune. He was not opposing, just saying it was not opportune. <laughs> There's a big quarrel now going on. But so my question is, uh, and then of course no wonder that at all levels, I mean, in, in Portugal they could not have been reached in this level of enabling uh, kleptocracies such as the Angolan uh, uh, kleptocracy or the Equatorial Guinea uh, kleptocracy and others, Russians, for instance now, very much Chinese, if uh, there was not a real industry of lawyers, accountants, real estate agents and so on, really totally complicit with the system and at their service. And this is going on. This is going on. Thank you, Ms. Gomez. Anybody else? Some private sector perspective. I see a hand raised here. There was a mic. Oh, it's really in the back. Sarah, please, here in the front. There's two. Oh, great. Thanks. Very kind of you. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, Sarah. Hi. My name is Aydar. Uh, I'm here as a representative of uh, Transparency International Kazakhstan, but uh, more than 10 years ago, I was with PwC. And uh, I don't recall any work for kleptocrats, but I can speculate professionally. I can do a professional guess. <laughs> for, confiden for confidentiality reasons, I think the Kazakh kleptocrats wouldn't go to Kazakh office. They would go to, to foreign offices, to European offices, to UK or to Swiss. Uh, we would get part of the work, but it would be, you know, under Chinese walls. When, when the client comes, they request legal and tax structuring for that kind of uh, transfers. And, um, and the partners just take the job, you know, because... Um, Cryptocracy may be based upon the the greed, and one of the forms of one of the legal forms of greed um, is desire of profit. And if technically it's legal, then that's okay. So I guess I can echo the words that 
the case is still here and I would refer to the words of another movie character called Gordon Greco. <laughs> greed is good. <laughs> it seems that greed still is good. Thank you so much. There was another hand raised here. Would you mind standing up? Thanks. Hi, uh, Noah Arshinoff from ACT International and the University of Ottawa in Canada. Um, I just want to quickly uh, pick up on the customer due diligence requirement, specifically as it relates to lawyers. Um, so my background is as a lawyer. Um, so I've worked in a private firm, I've worked for a bar association, I've been in-house counsel, now I do legal and policy consulting work. Um, not to, um, to identify Canada as having an inferiority complex, but I refer to our jurisdiction as kind of a little brother jurisdiction. The reason being we're right beside this, this country with a much bigger market. And what often happens if you're a corporate lawyer in Canada is your client will be a subsidiary of a multinational corporation headquartered elsewhere, whether that happens to be in the US or overseas. So part of the problem as a lawyer is that you have to do your due diligence, but your client is the Canadian sub. So now how far do you go in order to establish all those relationships that my client, the specific Canadian sub has, with all its other affiliates around the world? How far do I have to dig? Because if you make the rules overly onerous, my job goes from being a lawyer to being a customer due diligence specialist. So um, I think w that is one part of the problem. But the other side of that is that the Canadian sub who has come to seek my services is not actually asking me to do anything that's illegal. Right? So I'm performing legal work for them. So I'm performing traditional corporate legal work um, and that's where you get that blurred line between ethical and immoral, right? Um, and that's, I think, where the corruption side of it comes from. So I think that, and I don't, I don't have the answer to this question, and that's, I guess, what I'd like to throw to the room, is if anyone knows the answer of how do we better ensure that lawyers don't engage in helping corrupt kleptocrats, how do we do that based on these structures that we have? Because I, don't, I haven't found the answer yet. <laughs> We have to work together on these answers, and I think that's part of the goal of today to 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 start that conversation. Do you want to you want to address that? Oh, you want to? Uh, I have an answer. Uh, so, uh, I'm Scott Greatsack. I'm the director of advocacy for TIUS. Um, so we'll talk about the Enablers Act a bit more. That's what I'm going to be talking about. But everybody heard this morning, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan formally endorsed the Enablers Act on behalf of the Biden administration. Yeah, let's give a clap, absolutely. And there are a lot of folks in this room who helped us get there. A lot of folks, this has been dozens of civil society organizations, champions on the Hill. It's been over a year that this campaign has been going. But the answer, I mean, this is done in the UK. I mean, this is done in the EU. This is done in plenty of countries around the world. The answer is that we just need to have the same system that we apply for banks and other financial institutions apply to these gatekeepers. So here's a look at the folks that were identified one way or another when the Pandora Papers came out last October. Obviously, these papers, this is the largest financial data leak in history. Dozens of, uh, of journalists in 70 countries analyzed it to connect the dots to see what role enablers are playing in global corruption schemes. It talked about Equatorial Guinea. It talked about uh, Angola, it talked about the 1MDB scandal in Malaysia. There were over 30 trusts in the United States that were connected to folks credibly accused of fraud, bribery, human rights abuses, labor abuses, environmental abuses. The stories that the Pandora Papers uncovered showed that it was not, you know, in some other corner of the world that the folks who are helping corrupt officials get away with their crimes, literally, it was here in the United States. And since then, the United States has been found by the Tax Justice Network in the UK to be the number one home for dirty money in the world. And that is something that our own Secretary of the Treasury has said as well. So the good news is the Pandora Papers really demanded some reflection from our own, you know, for our own reputational interest, for the ability of folks to come to places like this conference on behalf of the US government and say they are champions in the fight against corruption. And so a bipartisan bill was introduced in the House last year. It gained momentum over the course of you know, six, seven, eight months until this past July, the House of Representatives passed the Enablers Act as part of our annual 
defense spending bill. Uh, it was then introduced in the Senate, and right now we are working, as I said, with a big, broad, bipartisan coalition to get that bill included in the Senate's version of the defense bill or any other opportunity we can get before the end of the year to get this over the finish line. And you heard, just heard today that the White House, for the first time, has publicly endorsed this bill, so we're really hoping that we can get it done. But you take a look at all the different folks who can serve as enablers in the United States. As we've been talking about, these are people who set up a trust. For example, in June, the US Treasury Department blocked over a billion dollars in assets that were connected to a Russian oligarch in a Delaware trust. That means that a US-based enabler set up that trust for a Russian oligarch. Uh, somebody investing money through an investment advisor. Uh, the FBI is currently investigating a firm based out of New York, an investment advisory firm that you know, is allegedly having moved over $8 billion for Roman Abramovich, another you know, very close ally of Vladimir Putin, an oligarch who looked around the world and found that here was the best place to invest his money. Forming a company, there is a mansion down the street in Georgetown, a $15 million mansion that is owned by a Delaware corporation that was set up by a US enabler that is linked to Oleg Deripaska, another one of Putin's closest allies. At the same time that we are doing as much as we can to support democratic principles and existing and emerging democracies like Ukraine in key parts of the world, we're letting these folks park their dirty money right under our noses. And so this has got to be a liminal moment where we say that we, we, we have the record in front of us, we have the legislation in front of us, the White House has just supported it, we need to rally together and make sure that we get this done this year so the United States can no longer have the shame and the albatross of being known facilitators to all of these scandals in different parts of the world. Yeah. Scott, if you want to keep the mic, let's, let's actually, uh, unless there was some... Other remark for now, but, but we'll come back to you. Stay where you are. Do you want to talk a little bit more detail about the Enablers Act right now and, and go a, little, a bit, describe a bit more what it is about? Um, and w because the, the, there's degrees, there's different degrees of involvement, definitely. There, and there's, the, you know, this, the question, oh, but it's legal. How does the Enablers Act go about it? What's, what's the detail? What's, what's over foreseen there? So we could go to the next slide. I think it's really interesting. Um, Jake Sullivan talked about how a year ago today they put out their US strategy on countering corruption. This is how they identified the problem. They basically said, if you look at the highlighted part, it's difficult to prove intent and knowledge that a facilitator, that an enabler was dealing with illicit funds or bad actors or that they should have known the same. So basically what happens is I'm an attorney. Somebody walks into your office and they say, I want you to form me a company. I want you to set up a trust that I can move money into. I want you to manage my money. I want you to invest um, my money into a, into a private equity or a hedge fund, whatnot. Right now, if I was a bank or if I was a casino, a pawnbroker, any of the other over a dozen things considered a financial institution under US law, I have to do due diligence on them. I have to check to make sure that they are not under you know, indictment in a foreign country for corruption charges. Uh, I have to perform a background check on them. Uh, if they are a politically exposed person, I could have greater you know, emphasis and obligation to do that. If they're a company and they walk in, I have to find out who are the actual human owners, who are the folks who own or control that company behind the corporate veil. Uh, if I am moving money for them and I have a reason to suspect that that money is coming from an unlawful source or being moved for an unlawful purpose, like taking money out of a country and moving it into the US financial system, I have to file a suspicious activity report with the Treasury Department. I have to put that flag up so that our law enforcement communities can go after it. The folks that we're talking about now, the lawyers, the accountants, the money movers, people who do it, they do not have those obligations. So the fix here is pretty simple. We just need to bring them under that same regime that we have right now for banks that would you know, that covers 100,000 different entities in the United States, and we have to make that apply to the lawyers and the accountants who perform those services. Oh, we can go to the, the next slide. And so that is exactly, and nothing more, what the Enablers Act does. It basically says, Treasury, now you have the statutory authority to create rules, just like you have for banks, that cover these enablers, these gatekeepers to our financial system. And then give me one more click, if you would. 
I think what's really, really important about this campaign is that while so many of the other democracy protection efforts in the United States have unfortunately become very partisanized, whether this is the role of money in politics or the role of lobbying or gerrymandering um, or you know all the voting rights restrictions that have been passed on a state level or changes to our election rules in different parts of the country, this is something that has remained very fiercely bipartisan. You can see a list of the supporting organizations for this effort. Uh, you've got the National District Attorneys Association, the largest association of prosecutors in the United States. They understand the role of this dirty money and how it affects American communities. You've got 80 plus environmental, social justice, climate organizations who have supported this. You've got uh, faith communities like the United Church of Christ. You've got environmental organizations like Greenpeace. Razum for Ukraine on the far right is the largest Ukrainian advocacy organization in the United States. They have dozens of diaspora communities from different parts of the world who have been the victims of kleptocracy who have called for this bill to close those loopholes that are taking money out of their citizens' pockets. You've got the largest anti-human trafficking organization in the United States, Polaris. You've got right-wing uh, foreign policy and security and defense organizations like FDD Action. And then my personal favorite, Flavor of the Month, Former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo tweeted in support of this last month that this is something we need to do in order to push back against uh, the power of China in, in the 21st century. So you've got an incredibly robust, uniquely uh, cross-partisan coalition of folks that are coming behind something that really will put points on the board in the effort to protect our democracy and democracies around the world. Scott, you didn't mention the ABA. Yeah, so the ABA, the American Bar Association, is not on this list. Uh, Thank you, Tutu, for teaming that up. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they're not up there. I'll tell you what, I'll make space if, if anybody's here from the ABA and wants to add there. Uh, so the American Bar Association was uh, one of the leading opponents to the Corporate Transparency Act that created a beneficial ownership registry in the United States. They lost that fight. They have been the chief opponent, unfortunately, representing uh, one trade group of lawyers here to the Enablers Act. We think we've overcome that obstacle as well, um, but they have been the main opponent to this bill. Uh, the last year. Thank you, Scott. Oh, there's, okay, I, we, let, let's like, let, let, let a couple of questions I see there. Um, if you don't mind walking up those, yeah, thank you, please, you, and then you second. Uh, hi, my name's Franz Wild. I'm from the Bureau of Investigative Journalism in the UK. I've got a follow-up to a question for Scott. Um, one huge problem we have in the UK is we have all these wonderful laws, but they kind of don't get enforced. And obviously everyone looks to the US as this uh, shining example of, of proper enforcement. Um, do, do you think, like, how do you see the current state of enforcement uh, in the US, particularly also with the kind of huge raft of um, uh, Russia-related sanctions? And now, you know, if, if the Enabler Act uh, comes in, will, will that actually be properly resourced um, and will there be proper enforcement there? I appreciate the question. So um, that, is, that is true. Uh, but in the United States, fortunately, um, while we may not have all the right laws on the books, the ones that we do have, we do tend to enforce them. And so Treasury has the overarching enforcement authority to enforce the Bank Secrecy Act. It does that, as I said, with 100,000 uh, financial institutions across the country. That is more than, I would imagine, the majority of the world's financial intelligence unit are responsible for. They have authority over that. They delegate it to organizations and agencies like the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, who can backstop them on enforcement. The FBI ob and obviously has investigatory capacity to figure out if there are violations of this. I do think we have a pretty good record that when there is credible reports and it meets the evidentiary standard for money laundering or violating the Bank Secrecy Act, that our enforcement agencies do go after it. And so if we change, look, it is gonna require that we have better resourcing for this, but that's a known problem. When the Corporate Transparency Act was passed, we know that we needed to have a beneficial ownership registry to solve this problem of corporate secrecy, right? It required in the bill that they, that they fund 
the implementing agency, FinCEN, our financial intelligence unit, to be able to get that job done. We know it's going to take more resources. We have to continue to push to make sure that these agencies are funded to accomplish those missions. But that doesn't mean that the mission is not as worthy as we think it is. It's just a matter of making sure that we provide the funding at the same time to get it done. But I do believe that if we put this on the books, it will be enforced, just as our other anti-corruption policies and laws are enforced. Yes, yes, and I was given the microphone. Oh, wonderful, so. wonderful. The microphone came to me. Sarah, thanks. Uh, I was wondering if you could paint a picture of um, what this money looks like in a normal American community. Why should, a nor or, or, you know, uh, British, English, Canadian, um, the, the money's coming to these places. Why should... Um, some, someone local care about it, uh, especially when, you know, you look at it at the other side, okay, well, maybe it's dirty money, but hey, it's, you know, it's coming in here, it's being invested, it's creating jobs, uh, you know, it's working capital in, I'm playing the devil's advocate. Uh, <laughs> uh, you paint a picture of how it might, um, uh, uh, how, how you would speak to someone, someone like that. Why, why should the average uh, person voter um, in these Western countries uh, care? Great question. Um, so I know a guy called, in England called Arthur. Can't remember his second name. His name his name's Arthur, um, and he he also has been fighting kind of money laundering. And I've gotten to know him a bit. And he, I remember once, and this the story really stuck with me. He told me that he used to live in a certain part of London, quite central, and it used to be a really vibrant community with local businesses really active. There was a pub. There was a local news agent, a dry cleaners. Um, you know, people knew each other. And he said over time, a lot of um, money came into that area, a lot of um, anonymous money, uh, money coming in through shell companies, and uh, local community were driven out, so kind of council estates were kind of, people living on council estates were moved out, and these big uh, skyscraper buildings, um, kind of full of luxury apartments were built. Most of them were empty, you walk past at night, all the lights are off, and he said over time, this kept happening in this, in this little area, over time, the news agent closed, the pub closed, um, the, the dry cleaners closed because there was no there was no local economy, so we talk about this money coming into our economy, but where is it actually going? In terms of the the local community, many of them were driven out, and these local businesses closed. So I mean that's just one anecdote, but I think there are questions around you know, is all money good money? Is it all really beneficial to ordinary citizens? I'm not sure it is. Um, for example, these flats were just empty safety deposit boxes. That's that's all they were. The money was going up. We've got a very stable property market in the UK, although prices have just fallen. But generally, it's pretty stable. It increases over time. It's a great investment. You've got money to, to hide, money to clean. I'm not so sure it's so good for, for local people, particularly when there's a housing crisis in the UK. There's a housing shortage. Um, and yet we have all these empty, empty flats. Hello. Um, I'm Roland Pop from Transparency International EU, um, and I would like to answer this specific question. Um, I have three different answers. One is, for example, people, let's say, on one side of the ocean, who like taxes, who like, you know, education, healthcare. I think the money is missing from there because these people are not paying taxes as well, and they are just hiding this wealth, so they are not taxed, so we have no money, basically, to do other, uh, what the state should do. Other, very much linked to what Rachel said, uh, one example is the golden visas, golden passports. In many countries, you could buy literally citizenship or a residency permit, and many times the requirement is uh, investing in uh, real estate. Now, what happened in those countries? Ms. Gomes can talk about Lisbon. Cyprus is the same, that at the end, there were no constructions for flats for normal folks. It was only these high-end luxury villas and mansions built up so that people are have nowhere to live. Um, and a third example, I, I must say it must be the Russian money. And right now there is a genocide of war in Ukraine and we are partly, partly financing it because those people who laundered their money into our systems and we are allowing it to happen. And I think this is, this is a grave security concern and if you are concerned about innocent people's life, uh, we should have acted before long, long ago, but now maybe it's time to realize that actually we became complicit with that instead of changing Russia's behavior. Thank you, Roland. Uh, I, had, um, I had a lawyer calling me once. There was a company involved in, a, in accused already of corruption and involved in several, actually twice or three times, involved in acts of corruption. And this lawyer called me 
and tells me, Juanita, this company is a client of mine, a lawyer, a lawyer. What would I have needed to do to realize what they were doing? I didn't know. He didn't know. So when we talk about citizens and the impact also on, on, on people, we also need to consider actually the other companies, the other members of these professions that are involved, they're also affected. They are also affected, they just don't realize. So the argument, oh, I do it because it's legal, I do it because I like it. We all have different degrees of, of risk aversion, but it also affects those people who don't clearly don't want to get involved. Um, so they, they also need a rescue, sort of a rescue <laughs> a paddle, <laughs> something that helps, that helps to bring them out. So I, I do think that impact also needs to be considered for the, for the policy options. And by the way, thanks Scott for, for sharing what, what's... I've, I've been doing a really lousy job as a moderator and I didn't even introduce you, but you did, you did it greatly. <laughs> Fabulous. But I will introduce Rachel before I ask her questions and we'll come back to you in a second. Because I want to push a little bit the button there on the, on the policy options. Rachel Davis, who did introduce herself, who leads the TIUK team on advocacy and is also heading the, the, the TIUK anti-corruption, the UK anti-corruption coalition. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about what's, what has been the policy options in the UK? How does it look like? Okay, um, I'll give a, a very brief snapshot of the situation in the UK and then I'm, I want to kind of briefly focus on two uh, policies that I think, policy areas that I think are really, really important to, to get right. So I, I think it comes as no surprise to everyone in this room, you know, the UK has long been rolling out the red carpet for corrupt individuals, for, for criminal individuals, you know, for decades, this is nothing new. Um, I think the UK is an attractive destination if you want to hide, clean, spend your money. I think probably for the same reasons it's an attractive destination for legitimate business, right? It's got a strong rule of law, it's got a stable property market, uh, connections to offshore financial centers, uh, and of course it's got a large and varied services sector. Um, Transparency International has done some, some research on this, Transparency International UK I should say. We looked at 400 corruption cases spanning 116 countries that amounted to about 325 billion pounds worth of economic damage. Uh, and we identified 582 uh, UK firms and individuals um, offering services in the UK, and I have to say, often unwittingly, I think that's, that's a really important point, to uh, corrupt individuals. And, and you can see kind of some of the sectors that we, we came across, some you'd expect, but also others you might not. So, you know, we found 177 UK education institutions. We also came across charities that had been um, taking... Uh, this money. We also know the UK unfortunately has a reputation laundering problem, it has a legal intimidation problem, uh, you know, looking at the legal sector in the UK and just, just to mention in the room we have two experts on this if anyone's really interested into deep diving on this later. We've got Georgia from the University of Sussex, Georgia giveaway if I don't know where you are, you're somewhere. Hi. Georgia is kind of midway through a big piece of research at the moment um, looking at the legal sector in the UK and how the legal sector enables kleptocracy. We also have Helen Taylor from Spotlight on Corruption sitting next to Georgia. Helen recently um, completed a really big piece of research on the legal sector and maybe after I finish talking, Helen, you might want to pop up and maybe share some of your insights, that'd be, that'd be really great. So I think we, we've kind of touched on this, but I think it's really important to acknowledge that there is um, a sliding scale of complicity, and I acknowledge this is a slightly imperfect um, summary because it doesn't include unregulated sectors, but hopefully it's, it's a good starting point. Um, you know, I think whilst it is beyond doubt that UK service providers are regularly exposed to suspicious funds, I think it's fair to say the nature and extent of involvement really kind of dramatically varies. On the one hand, you may have someone who... Um, through no fault of their own, quite, quite frankly, ends up being involved in kind of assisting the flow of dirty money. It might be you know, for all sorts of reasons, but often to do with kind of the system that's set up that they, they act within. On the other side of things, you might have someone who actually very deliberately caters to criminal and corrupt individuals. And then, of course, in between, you'll have a sliding scale of uh, entanglement. Um, in the UK, regulated sectors, um, they have to do some due diligence, they have to ask for beneficial ownership information uh, and file what we call uh, suspicious activity reports with the National Crime Agency if they come across wrongdoing. And this has, um, you know, we have had some positive out 
outputs from this. Uh, for example, in the DeSantos case, uh, 500 million pounds ended up being frozen connected to that case because of a SAR that I think one of the banks submitted. So in some ways it is working. However, there are vulnerabilities uh, with this system. And um, I want to touch very briefly on, on two kind of uh, policy areas, uh, which I would suggest that uh, countries like the US that are maybe doing some of this stuff for the first time outside the financial sector, um, maybe try and avoid some of the pitfalls that we fall, in and fall into because they can end up undermining um, a lot of the good work that's being done. The first one is um, around conflicts of interest. So in the UK, we have uh, what's known as professional uh, body supervisors. So these are um, organizations that are in the private sector uh, that have often two roles. They're both representative uh, bodies for the firms they oversee as well as being the regulators. So they're taking money from firms that they may have to sanction at some point. And I'm sure you can already kind of see why that might be a problem. And in fact, the government, um, the UK government has actually highlighted this uh, as well. Um, there was a report that came out, I think it was, was it last year or maybe a few years ago, where they found that 92%, 92% of the accountancy uh, professional body supervisors, so the, the, the firms that kind of overseeing uh, accountants and making sure they're following the anti-money laundering rules, 92% raise concerns um, about taking robust action against money laundering if that might risk or damage their ability to attract and retain members. They were saying, you know, I'm, anecdotally I heard of one, one firm saying, oh, we don't want to hand out more fines because we might lose members. Um, so there is a direct conflict of interest that I think needs to be resolved. I mean, we would suggest that you always make sure that the regulatory and the representative functions are legally separated and, and don't kind of coexist within the same legal entity. Um, the other thing I want to very quickly touch on is consistency. In the UK, we have 25 different supervisory bodies, 25. 13 for the accountancy sector alone, which is a lot. It's way too much. Um, you often find that there is inconsistent and of, at times inadequate enforcement um, you know, between these different supervisory bodies, sometimes even within the same sector. You look at, for example, the 13 uh, supervisors within the accountancy sector and they'll be giving out very different levels of fines. There's no consistency. And OPBAS, OPBAS is the body in the UK that's meant to um, kind of oversee uh, the 22 professional body supervisors. They don't have the powers to... Uh, forces, forces the wrong word, compel the supervisors to adopt certain standards. They can only encourage them um, to do so. Um, so uh, what Transparency International, also our partners at Spotlight and also Reese, who are in the room, is that <laughs> those 25 uh, supervisors are consolidated and we see a much smaller number that there is consistent enforcement uh, and standards across them. I want to end on a point of good news. Um, I'm an optimist and I think when you're talking about corruption all day, you can get very depressed. So the good news is, the really good news is that the UK government is onto this. They kind of acknowledge this problem and um, they're working to fix it. They're actually going to be, hopefully soon, we haven't got a date yet, but consulting on how to reform the system. So I really, I do have hope that the UK system will change very soon. Um, but yeah, points to think about for countries that are kind of veering into this area for the first time. And I don't know if it's okay, I'm not the moderator, abusing my position as a speaker. <laughs> Helen, are there, is there anything you want to share um, yeah. from the legal sector. Not sure if this is on. Uh, yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much, Rachel. And yeah, just to introduce myself, I'm Helen Taylor, a legal researcher at Spotlight on Corruption in the UK. And I spent most of my time um, in court monitoring some of the big uh, corruption cases coming through the UK courts. And just particularly, um, you know, I'd like to thank um, Florina and Tutu just for your um, sharing with us of the impact um, that the enabling of, of firms in the UK in particular has elsewhere. And I think that's key to our recognition in the UK of the role that we play in, in enabling global corruption. So just thank you for sharing that. Because what's often missed in these cases is really there's no spotlight on the enablers. Um, and, and that's really missing. Um, perhaps just to share sort of three takeaways from our experience, really building on, on what Rachel said. Um, the one is that um, I think the debate is really shifting in the in the UK. Um, Russia's renewed invasion of Ukraine has really, I think, for the first time, um, shifted the debate from what's legal, and we've heard a lot about that, to the question of what's ethical. Um, and a question was raised earlier about sort of, you know, why should we care about this if it's legal? And I, you know, part of it, I think, the answer to that is the impact um, that Tutu and Florina have pointed out. 
Um, but also it's about the fact that lawyers themselves, accountants themselves, bankers, I think, should really care about the reputation of their own profession. I think that's part of the answer. It's very easy to become de defensive and say, you know, it's not all lawyers or, or, or you know, we, we, we being used unwittingly. But I think, you know, the, the, what the US hopes to introduce through the Enablers Act, I think, is key, and every lawyer should support it, or every, you know, accountant or estate agent, because it's really key to upholding the public trust in the profession. And I think that's something in the UK we, we're realizing. Um, the second point is really building on what Rachel's saying, which is that we have a fairly strong regulatory framework, um, and you know the US following suit now will, will be brilliant, but it's all about supervision and enforcement as well, and that's an area where we're struggling, and, and I think Rachel's really highlighted some of the, the sort of policy areas or blind spots, weaknesses that I think um, the US and others would do well to try and sort of preempt in, in setting out a new system. Um, and just to, to mention on that, uh, probably the equivalent of the American Bar Association sort of pushed back in the UK is our law society has pushed back hugely at against a, a bill that's coming through Parliament at the minute, just uh, really explicitly recognizing as a regulatory objective of our legal supervisors that Rachel mentioned, the objective of combating economic crime. Um, and there's a big debate as to whether lawyers in particular um, and, and legal supervisors should have that as a regulatory objective. And I think it's really, really important that we recognize that the obligations lawyers have um, to combat money laundering through the AML reporting obligations is really, this is about making that explicit, and it's about making that commitment explicit. And I don't think that's at all um, you know, controversial, it shouldn't be, uh, and I don't think it's contradicti contradictory to lawyers' obligations to their clients or legal professional privilege, and I think that's something we should recognize, um, albeit a controversial thing to say. Um, and the final thing is perhaps also just on a positive note, and that's to say, uh, certainly I think we've learned a lot from a private sector perspective in um, how productive and fruitful collaboration can be between law enforcement and the private sector. Um, we've learned that on sanctions, I think particularly in, in, in the wake of Russia's renewed invasion um, and I think there's a lot of learning we can transfer that to um, you know combating global corruption and enabling um, really the, the, the productive partnership and the reliance that law enforcement has on the, on the private sector really coming to the party uh, and making sure that together we can combat economic crime thank you thank you so much Helen I don't know if Georgia want, wanted also to say something briefly hi yeah thanks Hello, hello, okay. Hi, um, I'm Georgia Garrett. I'm a researcher at the Center for the Study of Corruption at the University of Sussex. Um, and I just wanted to share sort of, hopefully in a complimentary way, sort of some of the research that we're currently in the middle of that I'm doing with Robert Barrington, um, that is complimentary to the discussion on uh, the, uh, s the implementation of AML legislation as it relates to enablers. Um, so our research, is um, based on the premise that um, sort of there is some kind of issue when it comes to AML systems and how well they capture um, the proceeds of corruption um, as opposed to other forms of uh, illicit finance. So when it comes to, for example, cases of the proceeds of corruption originating from countries in, in a situation of state capture or kleptocracy where the judiciary and the law enforcement are captured and where the laws have often been changed as well to benefit the people in charge, that AML systems um, don't capture where there is a lack of a predicate criminal offence. And so these cases are often not identifiable through a traditional AML system systems. So our approach is basically thinking that another element of the discussion around enabling comes down to culture and ethics and what clients law firms are what clients law firms are willing to take on and what kind of services they're willing to provide so we're sort of looking at four main areas um which is ac looking at access to justice <coughs> arguments and where where they can and cannot be reasonably applied because i think that there are distinctions to be made between where access to ju access to justice arguments are sort of um yeah reasonable depending on the service we've also been interviewing lawyers at large law firms in london obviously our research is focused on the uk um, to get an insight into how these issues are managed and reviewing um, publicly available existing codes of conduct at these law firms and what scope there is for dealing with um, ethical issues and finally we've been reviewing um, legal education in the uk to examine dominant approaches to legal ethics and how this might inform young lawyers attitudes to um, to ethical issues 
Um, so I think like we're halfway through our research, so there aren't any sort of concrete findings that I can share, but early indications suggest that law firms see their ethical responsibilities largely in terms of compliance. Um, so some ena enabling activity is obviously illegal, but some is not. So when it comes to commercial transactions, PR work, lobbying, um, where it is legal for law firms to provide these services, um, what we're seeing is that law firms are often not asking themselves the difficult questions that extend beyond what their legal and regulatory obligations are to encompass questions of what their broader responsibilities are to society, to uphold democratic values, and the integrity of the legal system and the legal profession itself. So I think one side of this debate is correctly about um, AML obligations, how well they're supervised and, and you know how well they're complied with, but the flip side of this discussion is about law firm culture and their approaches to business. Um, yeah, that's a brief summary. Um, we'll be hoping to be published sometime in May. But, um, yeah. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you. Make sure to disseminate it. And it's a very important point because it should not be restricted, our view should not be restricted on this issue to, uh, to AML. It, it, it passes not only through corporate social responsibility issues as well, which are not, not stranger to integrity issues. It's not just about human rights. It's also about integrity but also about citizenship and also about um, this complacency that, that we also find in turning sort of a blind eye, in turning, in, in making, just receiving the money just because it's money. Um, and an issue that has also been mentioned before. Roland, I wanted to pick your brains for a couple of minutes on what the EU experience has been. Um, uh, and what are the perspectives there and what are the limitations? Thank you very much. Well, in the EU, lawyers love supervision. Oh, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> so um, I will bring just a couple of examples which you may or may not be fa very familiar. Uh, da, da, da. No. I, okay, so I will go back. Okay, whatever. Um, so my first example is going to be about Estonia, another small country of 1.3 million people. It's a bit colder than Equatorial Guinea, but it's, it's a lovely place. Um, and so you all know that you are all familiar, I believe, with the Danske Bank case. Um, regarding the numbers of like the whole, whole uh, the sheer size of this, um, I had the slide somewhere. If it's gone, then don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. So the, it was 200, uh, 230 billion dollars. Uh, I can't really comprehend this number, I don't know, how about you? But it's around 10 times the annual GDP of Estonia. And that's what was laundered in one small branch of one not super major bank uh, in the EU. And of course, this influenced the whole, uh, the whole world and the, and the global financial market. And it's, it's very important to see that it was, of course, one, the main reason was, uh, is this, uh, yeah, uh, one, back, yes, this one. Um, so yes, indeed, and there were consequences. The consequences were around $2 billion paid in fine, the Danske Bank, different branches, and so on and so forth. And also about when it comes to PR, I love this, like they also donated 200 million, 25 million for charity, as if it would just make everything just fine and right. Um, and of course, there was these people sitting in Tallinn um, doing whatever they did. But it was not only one single bank who was involved, and the money from this Danske Bank branch went somewhere else. And I think I would like to bring one example, is that, for example, GP Morgan, already in 2013, said that they feel that it's too fishy dealing with this Danske Bank, and they just simply suspended working with them. Whereas many other major banks, such as Deutsche Bank and others, continued until the very last day, until this whole uh, scandal erupted, and they pretended there was nothing there, and as if the customers of Danske Bank uh, were just regular customers. Um, so who, who else was not, like, yes, there are some prosecutions, there are some fine, who else was not prosecuted? Those who are the other major banks of the financial world, maybe not in Estonia, maybe in other countries, in the UK, EU, elsewhere, who are still dealing with uh, with this one bank, which they should have known it's fishy, since some banks realize that there are some problems with their, uh, let's say, customer diligence work, at least, uh, but they turned a blind eye, at least. Who else was not, uh, let's say, um, 
well, not even persecuted, but like uh, they were like, no, responsible, hold, hold responsible for this, the supervisory bodies. Because it's very interesting, so the EU is a very um, wonderful uh, organization where at the end of the day, the member states agree on something, but at the end of the day, it's the uh, member states themselves who need to enforce those rules. And there's one thing what member states don't like, if other countries pointing at fingers at them that they are not doing their job. Whereas unfortunately we've seen many times, and this is probably one of the biggest problems of the EU, is that the whole EU was created in an idea that member state authorities and member states themselves and governments will just do and play according to the rules. It's not the case. But unfortunately what we have seen, for example, with this, that's this Danske Bank case, uh, the next slide please, is that there is a European banking authority who should have investigated whether there was a breach of EU law. And they decided that was the whole, well, maybe you don't see it, it doesn't matter, that's the whole thing what they came up with is that they are not going to investigate it. Why? Who are sitting there? Is the board of supervisors. So the national supervisory bodies of the 20, back then I believe 28, uh, member states were sitting together whether they should look into whether those supervisors of Denmark and Estonia did their jobs or not. They decided, let's not point it to fingers into each other, let's move on, case closed, nothing has happened. And I think this is really telling that, you know, the big question for us in this, in this panel is that who's guarding the guards, guards being the enablers, but and also who's guarding the guards who are guarding. <laughs> and in the case of the EU, it's very complicated and unless we fix it in some ways, for example, with the new anti laundering authority, it's gonna be keep up as a problem that unless the national supervisors not doing anything, nothing will happen, and it will influence, well, actually the whole world. Next slide, please. Uh, one more. Yes, so um, I brought an example from the non-financial sector from Germany, uh, where they also need to report, they already need to report the suspicious transaction reports for a while, and you've seen that it went up crazily, hundreds of percents, but also because the number was very, very low only a couple of years ago. TI Germany had uh, some very interesting research looking into the details. Next one, please. So if you look, those are the numbers of how many suspicious transaction reports were submitted within Germany, the whole 83 million people, uh, million people living there uh, in 2019. Um, from the whole Germany. Uh, I don't remember the exact number of how many self-regulatory bodies are there because for all each professions it's different, but it's a crazy amount of, 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 of uh, supervisory bodies. It's, I would say it's probably even worse than the UK. And so that was the numbers of, of 2019. Now what happens, the next, if there is a bit more money put into supervision? Surprise, surprise, from notaries, from 17, in 2021, it was already 6,400 something suspicious transaction reports. Now the question is whether notaries did not see anything uh, only a few years ago. Probably they have seen the same things. Uh, let's be realistic, let's be honest. Probably there is much more going on under, but unless there's a proper supervision, uh, they will just not report. But if you put money, and here it comes to what, what Scott already said, that at the very first stage, you need to make sure that there is money and resources put into the uh, proper supervision, because unless they are supervised, they will just not report, and they will just go under the radar. Um, one, my last slide is, again, it's about um, Russia. I have to talk about it because it's, it's horrible, and it's horrendous how much many of the banks um, we're not doing their job. So there is uh, the, the Russian Commercial Bank of Cyprus. Uh, pff, even in their name, they are very obviously said and wanted to bring Russian money into uh, Cyprus. For many years, uh, Cyprus was the biggest foreign direct investor in Russia. Cyprus has less than one million people and it's not a, such a big economy. Obviously, all that money is being laundered through Europe. Um, and someone mentioned of like Googling some people. Yeah, if your client is a cellist who owns millions of euros. Uh, if you Google his name and he's the godfather of Putin's daughter, there might be some you know, red flags raised. And it did not raise many red flags until uh, those, are, those are from the Panama Paper revelations. And obviously it's a question of how come they knew, they must have known, and they didn't know anything. And now we are here. Uh, those um, proceeds also happened much after Crimea, much after Georgia, and we knew and we were welcoming the Russian money into our democracies. Thank you.
Thank you, Roland. You also enlarged the list of, of actors and enablers. And we realized there may be a need for different policy responses for different types of actors because of the nature of their involvement as well. Um, I would just like to rope in, I don't know if there's someone from, from, from this morning's session on uh, corporate secrecy, because the topic that was discussed there um, sort of also taps in uh, into, into this one. James, you're there. Um, is, are there any policy recommendations that, that were discussed in that session that, that you would want to bring into this one that you find might, may be relevant? Um, well, you know, talking about the, the company's formations agents, I think there was a lot of it that we were talking about this morning about putting more penalties and harsher penalties, especially on the law firms. And I, is Frank here? No, but uh, Frank Vogel was mentioning, and I think in Canada we've got legislation that's being proposed of putting through uh, penalties on law firms or any of the enablers um, who, that, that goes beyond just a, a, you know, a fine of doing business, something that would actually lead to a criminal conviction of being involved in signing off on documents. And it, it goes to that sliding scale, Rachel, of how do you prove it? And I think that's, that's one of the cases, but putting something that would make those who are willing to do their job in a kind of lazy fashion think twice and, and make them actually um, and do, their work, uh, do their work properly. So that's one of the tools. I would say another tool maybe just based on um, Jack Sullivan's statements and the support of the Biden administration and talking with another uh, Lucifer Weiss from TI Netherlands about how, you know, is, is there um, a benchmark we can put for countries to set up kind of like with um, the, you know, the Paris Agreement, there's specific benchmarks. We've always said within the anti-corruption movement, you know, we have uncac and things, but there's generalities. There's not a benchmark. I'm wondering, Scott, or is there anybody from State Department here who would see fit that if the, the U.S., with all its power is saying everyone's turning to us to be global police officers of anti-corruption laws and anti-money laundering laws. It's about time the rest of you kind of catch up the same way we saw, we've seen the US say, hey, pay up on your NATO uh, obligations, pay up on your, if we're now looking at money laundering as a much as much of a securitized issue as say uh, building up NATO, should the U.S. be pushing countries like Canada and others to say, what is your anti-money laundering budget? How many officers do you employ? What's your FIU budget? Um, we've all got to go up to the scale because it can't just be the U.S. All of us have to be a scary place for these enablers to work. Thank you, James. I would just add one thing that we, we have not mentioned here that is also important in, 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 in this question of enablers that was mentioned this morning and I found it was a really good idea to strengthen even more anti-slap uh, action and whistleblower protection. Because at the end of the day, in the absence of regulation, self-regulation, it's journalists and whistleblowers who are raising these cases and, and they're being attacked for it. So it, it's, we mention this again and again, but all the more that is part, should be part of the policy packages and the things that we consider. Now, um, we need to wrap up, unfortunately. And there's two things that I want to do before we wrap up. One, that we all together join in a big, big clap to TIUK and TIUS for organizing this session. <laughs> and, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, but I was so eager to start you, <laughs> that I totally forgot it. Thanks so much for putting this topic in its place and for making sure that we can have a discussion. And um, the other thing I want to do before we leave is I would like to have some closing thoughts from each of you, if, if you may, as closing as they be in less than one minute. I don't know if, Florinda, do you feel f ready to start? Or to do. Okay. Well, first of all, I mean, thank you for the organizers, and thank you. I mean, I think these are uh, issues that need to be. Uh, we need to keep talking about them, right? I think is one. If one thing is clear, I mean, I, I don't know that many lawyers over there they will get a client like Isabel dos Santos or Theodorine and unwittingly 
represent those guys. <laughs> yes, in, I mean, I understand what you're saying about Canada, right? But when you get someone walk into your office with $100 million, you know who that person is. And there are questions that you should be asking. If I walk into your office and I, I'm, I'm telling you I need to buy a house that's $30,000, you're going to be asking me who I am. A hundred million dollars should be asking, right? So clearly, you know, there is there is there is a space over here where we have to grow. I'm glad to see that the U.S. is moving in the right direction. I think there are institutions out there, the African Union. We've been talking about Europe and all that. The African Union is there, you know, is lagging behind. There are initiatives in Africa, and those of us working in Africa, we have to be pushing the African Union and other people in Africa to make sure that you know we're giving these issues the attention they deserve, right? But Again, to be continued, I'm happy to be here, and uh, let's keep the pressure on. And I have to say, I'm a lawyer myself, you know, and I know that most of us are ethical and good people, but there are some unscrupulous people out there, you know, let's make sure that, you know, we're putting the right pressure on the right people to do the right thing, so. Thank you. Well, th thank you. Um, I mean, so, I, I know it's sometimes hard to imagine um, a little kid <coughs> somewhere in Angola <coughs> who didn't go to school, who couldn't go to school because there's no school in the community. It's probably hard uh, to imagine um, a, a, a young fellow who see their dreams postponed every single day because they don't have access to higher education or um, um, employment. Um, but let's, let's just take a moment <coughs> Let's just take a moment and think about it. How many people, not just in Angola, uh, even in places like Pennsylvania, where I used to work not too long ago, out uh, Altoona town, uh, how those communities uh, were devastating. I mean, just, just think about it. Like, what is behind all that? Um, and is this money is really worth it to have here? And who's profiting from? Um, I know someone asked, well, how can you explain how it's affect folks here in the US, which is important because, and I would say no, no regular individuals, no workers for sure. Um, but let's, let's just take a moment, think about our core values like democracy that have been eroded for decades and we have ignoring because of the, the greedy. <clears throat> Let's just think about it. Are, you, are we really willing to sacrifice our core values because of additional million dollar in the bank account? Uh, what about our future generations where we would like to be like where Ukraine is right now? The lives that we have lost Thank you. Thank you so much. Just quickly, uh, it's about strong regulation, but it's also about how we drive changing attitudes and behaviours in the professional services. And all that's to say, Georgia, I'm really looking forward to your research coming out in May, and hopefully that'll have some answers for us in that area. They say it took 12 years to get the Corporate Transparency Act done to create a beneficial ownership registry in the span of one year since the Pandora Papers Enablers Act has been passed by the House. You heard the Biden administration come out for the first time in support of it today. We will get this done, even if it can't be done through Congress. You heard Jake Sullivan talk about how there will be rules for real estate agents and money laundering real estate. There are other enabler types that they can do through the administration. We'll push on that. In the meantime, I agree this is about canon, law, and culture. And until we get canon, we'll push on the cultural fronts to name and shame the folks who participate in these sandals around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, I think it's very important to say that this name and shaming can work and should work. And there is one, let's say, law of physics in dirty money that dirty money can move, but it never moves by itself. So, the, so there's always someone who is moving, moving it. And thank you very much for attending this panel. Thank you, everybody. Thank you also for joining, participating actively, and have a good evening.